So we're on to section, uh, part five of our series on purity. So we're all happy with that so far, aren't we? I've noticed everyone's still here. That's good. The purity issue hasn't put, put, pushed anyone away. No one's gone running for the hills thinking I am filthy, dirty, I cannot come into this building anymore. That's good, isn't it? It's good, because if, even if we thought we weren't filthy, dirty, our own righteousness is like filthy rags to Jesus, isn't it? So the only pure and righteous because of Jesus. That's the only reason any Christian gets to feel at peace, isn't it? All right, it's not because we're great and super amazing. It's because Jesus is amazing. So let's go to today's passage. It's Hebrews 5. Grab your Bibles, please. Let's have a look at this together. And I'm just going to skip through this, uh, this passage because I want you to see a couple of things um, that are particularly uh, relevant in some ways, but also uh, there's a couple of that are not, but I still want to pick them out. So have a look at this. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, Paul is obviously talking about the old Levitical system. He's talking about how the Jews were acting out what it actually takes for us to be made right with God, which is death. When God gave you free will, he didn't go, oh, here here you go, have free will, I'll see how it goes, and then I'll figure out what to do. God did not do that. God is not uh, short-sighted. God, it says the lamb who was slain, that's Jesus, was willing to die before the foundation of the world. So Jesus did, and in, was in the Godhead as the word made flesh. Jesus had to die, and they knew that before they gave us free will. And now we're talking about Jesus in this passage. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. All right? That's Jesus. He doesn't find a non-Christian, grab them, and say, Oi! What's wrong with you? Follow Jesus now! That was a proper Cockney accent. Did you hear that? That was a bit like East End London. Good, isn't it? Could have been in a movie, that bit, couldn't it? Um, Since he himself is subject to weakness. The reason that Jesus, the Word made flesh, the the person of God, the Word, was willing to go into a human body was so that he would understand fully what it means to be sinful or to be tempted at least. So Jesus understands your your position. He knew what it was like. He knows where you've been. He knows what's happened to you. And he is ready to forgive you right now. He isn't saying, oh, but you just need to be good enough. He's not even slightly saying that. He says, I'm good enough. I'm good enough for you. You don't need to prove anything. You just need to trust me and repent and trust in my death on your behalf. And then we get to verse 5. It says, in the same way, it says, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. So there was a thing about being a priest in the temple where they were highly esteemed people. Okay? They They had a reputation. They're the high priest. Not just the priests, the high priests. Okay? And there was a a certain status to that in those days. And God said this to him, you are my son. Today I've become your father. The The complimentary thing there is that by saying I'm not trusting in my status, you behave like a child of God. It says Jesus did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but instead God said to him, you're my son. And that's what mattered to God. That's what mattered to Jesus. It doesn't matter what role you have in church. God has got a role for you, but it's not your role that makes you anything. What makes us right with God is sonship. Being a daughter or a son of God himself. That's the place we've got to get to. None of the, Not religious behavior. I'm not going to try and prove I'm, I'm good enough for God. There's never going to be a point where I'm good enough for God. Do you understand that, right? It's only about... Trust in him that you've been born again into his family. That's what a born-again Christian means. You're born into his family. And from then on, you're his son or you're his daughter. And it goes on to say that this son, verse 8, learned obedience. Even Jesus had to be discipled, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit was speaking into, to Jesus, communicating with Jesus. Jesus was growing in wisdom and stature with men and with God, it says in the Bible. So Jesus learned obedience. That doesn't mean he was being disobedient, but it means on the things where God wanted him to listen. And so I want you to follow this path in your life. Jesus followed. He obeyed. He could have said no. In fact, when he was in the garden, he said, Lord, if it's possible, take this route that you've got for me from me because it's going to hurt. I don't want to do this. I don't want to just go and get flogged and get... I mean, I'm checking there's no... There are kids in the room. Okay, I'll change my words. I don't want to be dealt with by the Romans as they dealt with people, which was horrendous. He wasn't joyfully going, oh, this is great. It won't be that bad. He knew he was sweating blood. He knew it was terrible. And so Jesus, in his flesh, is anticipating all that's going to happen, and he chooses still to do God's will. Not my will, but your will be done, Jesus said. Okay. There's just a little bit more that Paul then talks about. He talks about the warning against falling away. The reason that we continue to obey God is because we don't want to harden our hearts. We've seen that in the previous two chapters, three and four. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If God starts to speak to you and you know it's for you, you've got to say, okay, God, that's, that's good. It'll be good then. If you're speaking to me, then your path is better. I'm going to take your path. And he actually has a little bit of a go at the, uh, the church here. Paul says, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Are you a teacher, Liam? Yes, you are, my friend. Yes, you are. Are you a, are you a teacher, Betty? Yes, you are, my love. Don't, don't downplay what you do. We're all teaching others all the time. You might be deliberately not teaching anyone. Going, I'm, going, I'm going to teach you sin. I'll teach you how to be really bad. You're still teaching. So what matters is that we are able to distinguish, Kev okay, said this earlier, didn't we, between good and evil, increase our discernment, to know what's right. What is, what is God's best in this situation? That's what I want to know. And that's what I want to walk in because it's going to be good for me. So, as you might have noticed by my general demeanour, this isn't on purpose, by the way. I'm always like this. Okay, I'm a fairly passionate person. All right? Would you agree with that? Would you agree with that, Elijah? I'm fairly passionate, man. Ooh, I can feel it. And sometimes I overact just to, just to make it exciting. And sometimes I put you on the edge of your seat because you're thinking, do I run now? Is it, do I go now? Or is he going to grab me? I'm not going to grab you. It's okay. I might give you a hug later. Because passion is neutral. Money is neutral. Blessings and ability are neutral. You can use them whichever way you want. And I will openly confess that I used my passionate character, my, sorry, personality, let's say. I had particularly, I was quite strong in this area already. The only problem with passion in my life was that I used it completely in the wrong area. I used it for very destructive purposes that I'm not going into now. If you want to talk to me later, I'll tell you some of that stuff. But it was bad. It was bad. And I want to talk to you today about pure passion. Pure passion. So what kind of passion is that? Who wants to tell me? What's pure passion, Kev? Go on, Chris. Godly. Godly passion. So let's get into... Oh, I'll just say before I do. Pure passion, anything that I teach you and from the front here, is not in isolation from what was said last week. You know that? And the week before and the week before. So everything we're learning is on top of, isn't it? So we don't go, well, I can just, oh, God wants me to be passionate. That's it. That's all I've got to do. Just be passionate. <laughs> no, you still got to be obedient. You still got to be united, not divisive. You still got to be looking for the good in people and loving people. So let's have a look at this word, passion. There we go. My usual reference to the uh, internet. I like to, you know, rely on the internet for everything. Don't you? It's terrible, isn't it? It's embarrassing. Anyway, this is what they say on the internet about the word passion. And I'm not going to fully go along with this, but I think you might, this might sound familiar. Oh, it does actually say number two is good. Number one is strong and barely controllable emotion. Would anyone agree or disagree with that? Hands up if you think that sounds about right with passion. Passion's kind of barely controlled. Yeah, good. Quite strong, intense feeling, right? 
It's emotional. It's emotional. Number two, it says the suffering and death of Jesus. Now, why would it say that? Well, I'll tell you. Has anyone seen the film The Passion? If you have not seen that film, I urge you, please take a risk and watch it. Have you, you've seen it, have you? What did you think? Unbelievable, wasn't it? Brilliant depiction by Mel Gibson, I think, was it? Fantastic. I mean, fa not fantastic as in lovely, fantastic as in real. As in real. And when you watch that film, you think, oh my gosh, Lord Jesus. Oh my gosh. Oh Lord, you did that. Oh my gosh. It really brings it home to you how much passion Jesus has to die for you. And you. And you guys. The passion of Jesus. So it's derived from the Latin passio, which in turn is derived from the verb patior, with the root pats that you can see there. And the Latin words are connected with the Greek root path. We've been talking a lot about paths at the moment, which appears in a large number of derivatives. So that's just talking about where the word comes from, the etymology, if you like, of the word. Number one, Acts chapter one, verse three, it actually says, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion. It's talking about Jesus saying, after he did what was the most important thing for him emotionally, which was to bring us all into the kingdom with great passion, he went and did these other things. He, he turned up and showed himself. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, if you want to check it. It's also got connotations of suffering. Most of the time, passion overrides comfort, doesn't it? We don't sit and take it easy. We've got passion. We're actually driven to do something. And that can be challenging to us. And the last thing there, it talks about emotion and strong emotion. And you can check those passages out if you want. So here's my first question. Ready, team? Team one, two, three, four. How do we know someone is passionate about something? And what's the evidence that they care? Already? Off you go. Ten seconds. In your groups, go. Oh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. In your group, how do we know someone is passionate? about something and what's the evidence that they care about that thing all right off you go how do you know someone's actually really genuinely passionate about something and what's the evidence that they care about that thing okay you ready got anything we might have something let's see how we go i'll start this side because you look ready john are you ready <laughs> sort of i said ready <laughs> i mean I mean, you would face this direction, so that doesn't mean a lot in some classes. You know, as a teacher, you look at it, are you ready? They're like, uh, uh. They're not ready at all. They're just going, oh, we have to stop. Come on then, what do we think? What, how do you know someone's passionate about something? Sarah, Tiani? Very good. They're consumed by it. It takes up a lot of their time. I completely agree. Guess what? I'm passionate about church. So is Jesus, by the way, just so you know. So it takes up a lot of my time. And if you're volunteering for church and it takes up a lot of your time, you've got passion for your church. That's what it means. Good. Go on, Betty. And they talk about it all the time. They talk about it all the time. Do you agree with that? Everyone agree with that? Yes. If you're passionate about Jesus, you don't like wait till Sunday before you mention his name. Jesus. Am I okay in here? No one's going to arrest me. No one's going to arrest you, mate. But you need to, if you've got passion for Jesus, you need to talk about him. Right? Because he's awesome. What did you guys have? Marcia. I just thought um, the support someone has, like people wearing football jerseys and stuff, they're very passionate about their sport, they, they wear their football jerseys um, for their support. Unashamed commitment and to be known by. Yeah. The more passionate you are as a Christian, the more you don't care what other people think. You think, guys, I love you enough to make it obvious I'm a Christian because it's you who needs to be saved, not me. But I'm grateful I'm saved. And I've got, he, he's, got, I've got, he's got my number and I've got his name on my back. Interestingly, Miracle recently told me that he had his uh, granddad's name on his back. And we were talking about it in Connect Group, wasn't it? Was it his granddad or uncle? Granddad. Because he was celebrating how great this guy was in uh, Samoa. Uh, guys, what did you have? Uh, how do you know someone's passionate about something? We've, it's been coming up every week. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added. It's not that you're not going to get them, but it's the number one priority. They prioritize. That was great. We had loads of great answers. Thank you. 
But I'm going to move on to talk about an element of passion that's in the Bible, all the way through the Bible, and it's going to possibly scare a few of you blokes. Maybe not Nathaniel, I know he's, he's a regular crier. Um, sorry, sorry. I, can't, I could not resist that one, I could not. But do you know, crying is the peak of emotion. Crying. You know that? It's the peak of emotion. It says in this article written by Harvard Health Publishing, obviously I read these articles all the time. No, I didn't, I just found this one while I was doing the, uh, doing the preach. But, the sermon. It says in here, emotional tears, listen to this, which flush stress hormones and other toxins out of our system, potentially offers the most health benefits. It's actually healthy to cry, do you know that? Not all the time. So Liam, it's unacceptable mate, yeah? You've got to calm it down a little bit. Not all the time in school. <laughs> oh, school again. <laughs> um, but at the end of it, it says, I know a man ain't supposed to cry is a lyric from a song, but these tears I can't hold inside. I won't sing them to you. Nikki could. She's good at singing, isn't she? These words succinctly summarise many a man's dilemma about emotional expression. From early on, boys are told that real men do not cry. Is that true? It's mostly true, isn't it? In most Western societies, the boys are told, come on, stop crying. Stop being so weak. I say it regularly to my boys. It's great, isn't it? I'm a good dad. I'll work on this one. But I get them, I say, no, no, don't cry about that. Just think it through and say, ow, this hurts. There will be things that you will need to cry about. This is not one of them. So I don't say, don't cry, because that would be pretty poor, poor, poor parenting. Other than cutting onions, anyone cry when they cut onions? All right, let's try another one. Anyone not cry when you cut onions? Right, exactly, right. Other than cutting onions, or when you're in physical pain, crying tends to happen when we feel something strongly. That'd be true. Sadness, frustration, happiness, or love. And it's usually at the peak of that feeling, says a professor. So I'm going to take that as fairly likely that's true. Would you agree with that? It's a bit, bit of a risk, but Professor Hudson said that. Question number two. In today's passage, Hebrews 5 verse 7, if you haven't noticed it, it says, Jesus cried loudly and with tears. It also, in John 11, 33 to 35, talks about Lazarus when Lazarus was dying. And it says Jesus, when, it says this, when Jesus saw her weeping, talking about Mary, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Dot, 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 Jesus wept. The reason Jesus cried was he was deeply moved by the situation that was in front of him. It wasn't a hopeless kind of crying. It was a, this is awful. My poor friend has died and is now dead in, in a tomb, and his sisters are crying their eyes out. And Jesus wept. He didn't rock up and go, man up, would you? What's wrong with you? This is pathetic. Did he? He wept, properly wept. And God, that is God in flesh, crying about your situation. God doesn't go, I don't care. I'm, uh, what's the word, immutable, I'm untouchable. Nothing moves me. That is total rubbish. If you think... God doesn't care about your situation, you've been lied to. Jesus wept. And it says, with loud cries, he cried out to God, God, please, Lord, please, Father. And I want to ask this question, just very quickly. When did you last cry? Okay, 10 seconds, have a think. When did you last cry? I might pick on a few very scared-looking people and then get them to tell me. You don't have to tell me what it was about. You can just give me a date, time and date. Time and date's fine. When did you last properly cry? Friday. Good, that do. There you go. Not too far away. Who can beat Friday? Sunday morning. The winner. The crying winner's over here on my left. Can anyone beat? Can anyone beat 10.35? Has anyone been crying just recently? Like Maybe during the worship or... And Gary's singing might have caused a few tears. <laughs> sorry. He knows, listen, I'm oh, sorry. He, he can take it. He can take it. 
Sorry. <laughs> that was too easy. Um, okay, let's go. Friday? Friday, right? Anyone else on this side want to give me a day that they cried recently? Come on. Anyone? Thursday. That's not our fault. That's good. You're in there. You're in there with a chance of like top three. Top three. Anyone else cried recently? You guys cried recently? Come on. I cried on Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm, I'm just out of the league table. Typical, isn't it? Still trying to win everything. Anyone cry on this side? Yes, we got that one, didn't we? Early doors today. I was crying on Wednesday, you know, during the prayer meeting. I was just suddenly just overwhelmed by the need for people to meet Jesus in a certain location I was thinking about in this town. Sometimes God does that. It's because he's stirring us up. He's trying to get us to connect with him and think what really matters in life. What really matters. So I'm going to put this to you you, and I hope that you agree. God is a very passionate being. He is not stoic, cold, disconnected. He is passionate about you and me. Passionate. He died in your place because he loves you that much. Doesn't matter what you've done, he died for you. He died for you. Actually died. I'm not talking about like disappeared for a bit. He actually took on the passion. If you watch that movie, you'll see what's actually happened. But God also laughs. Look at this. In Psalm 2, I mean, it is a bit of a derisive laugh. It's the kind of laugh that God goes, oh my word, look at them now. Trying to pass laws to stop the church. Mr. Andrews. (laughs) Oh dear, look at that Andrews. He actually thinks he can stop the kingdom of God. That is pretty funny. That's what God's thinking. That's actually kind of amusing. Not in a kind of, this is great, oh, loads of people going to have problems. He's just thinking, that is such a ridiculous concept. You ever laugh like that? You're just laughing. That is crazy. That's just stupid. You're laughing because it's just stupid. Dan Andrews is not going to stop the kingdom of God. I'll tell you that now. It says in the word, the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Do you believe that? We are in the body of Christ. Jesus isn't going to be beaten by anybody. Jesus is far more supreme and powerful than Dan Andrews. Bless him. He's just a human. Remember that preach? That sermon? He's a human. And humans rail against God all through history. But God is still growing his church. The kingdom of God is still getting bigger. In the early days, the church didn't stop. Right? Right? During the early tribulation when Caesar Nero was doing horrendous stuff to Christians, it grew. And in China, it didn't go small when the communists took over and made sure you couldn't even talk about Jesus. It grew. So we're not on the losing side somehow. We've got God who laughs about stuff like this. So get your faith into God's ability, not your own. Stop thinking about what other people are doing and saying. Start to pray to your God in heaven who laughs. He laughs at the terrible actions of people because they're so futile. He also rejoices. Have you ever, have you, who's rejoiced recently? Has anyone been happy about something? Put your hand up if you've, you've been happy. Yeah, good, good. It wasn't Tottenham, was it? Because we lost 3-0. And we're useless right now. So I'm getting no rejoicing about soccer right now. But as good as other things I get excited about. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. When you give your life to Jesus, today, tomorrow, tonight, next month, whenever it is, or when you fully commit to his ways, he rejoices. He's like, yes, son, well done. Yes, daughter, good choice. Well done, you're back on track. And then Jesus told them this parable. This is to confirm this. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. What does Jesus do when he loses someone who like, used to believe in God a bit and they just wander off and start doing all sorts of crazy stuff? What does he do? Just leaves them, doesn't he? Goes, ah, good, didn't want you anyway. No, he doesn't. The Bible says, doesn't he leave the 99? There's a cool song about that one, isn't there? Leave the 99. In the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. Yes, he does, is the answer. And when he finds it, look what he said. Look what he does. Look what he does. He joyfully puts it on his shoulder so, and goes home, takes you home, brings you back into the fold, brings you back where you're supposed to be. 
Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. Has anyone ever lost something and thought it was gone? And you're like, man, I love that thing. I'm so gutted. I wish I hadn't put it down and I have no idea where it is. Can't find it. Man, that was such a great... And then you find it. You met... Who's done that? Has anyone hand up? Tell me, yes. Was it good news? Was it a moment of rejoicing? Kev? Chris? Pretty awesome, isn't it? You're like, oh, yes. And that's just a thing, guys. Just to put it in perspective. That's a thing. But you personally were made by God. And when he gets you back, he is over the moon. I can tell you that now. So number three, God rages. Some of you are going, yeah, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. He's bad. He's angry, isn't he, all the time? No, he isn't. But he does rage when things are being... He's a jealous God because he loves you so much. He doesn't want the crap in your life. He loves you too much to go, oh, just leave you alone and hopefully you'll smash yourself to bits. No. God is grieved when we're in sin. God is hurting when we're struggling. He doesn't love that at all. Let's, let's see what the Bible says. You overthrow those who rise up against you. Why is that then? Is, he, is God precious, is he? Or is it better that we have someone in charge who loves God? What do you think? What's, what's better for, for the, the whole society? That we have people in charge who are righteous or we have people in charge who are evil? Which one? Righteous. It's not hard, is it? So God is like, oh, this is rubbish. I need to get rid of this guy. I'm going to remove him. He does remove people eventually. When they've gone far enough, he will remove them from their influential place in your life. Don't worry if someone exits your life and someone enters your life who's good and righteous. Just think, okay, maybe God needs me to spend time with people who are righteous right now. And those other people were not what? They were not God's best. He goes on to say, I mean, he talks about our stubbornness of heart. Look, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up for yourself a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. If you refuse to submit to Jesus, of course, your own sin is on you. That's the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for you. Feel free to, you know, accept it or don't accept it. It's your choice. And lastly, God, as I said, weeps over loss and the lost. Okay, Luke 19, 4, it says, And when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Now, if you're a man's man like me, and I've had a pretty volatile, rough past. I was a, I'm an ex-judo fighter, rugby player. I like physical contact. I used to do boxing. I like, I like that stuff. And if you read that when you're a Christian or when you've just become a Christian, you might think, oh, it sounds a bit namby-pamby, this Jesus, a bit weak. No. No, Jesus wasn't weak. Yeah, meekness is when you've got total power and you still lay it down. Jesus said, you don't take my life from me, I give it up. Jesus was the manliest man you could ever picture in your mind. He is super strong, super awesome, and he wept. Why did he weep? Because he knew how many Jews were rejecting him. He knew how many of those people, when presented with Jesus himself, right in front of them, said, no, I'm not going to believe. That grieved God because he knew what's going to happen. Well, then you'll pay for your own sin. I can't do anything else. I'm not going to force my way into your life. You choose. It grieves God when we reject him. Okay, so godly men and women cry. Okay, that's my, my opening point. So you're getting worried, aren't you? And that's the introduction over, as we say, <laughs> after 25 minutes. All right. There was a fleshly and a spiritual kind of, of weeping and crying. Fleshly is when you are letting all sorts of negatives take over your mind and you're just weeping and crying because you don't have any faith that God's on your side. Fleshly. Okay? You can still weep and have faith at the same time. We were talking about, kind of, that's what we were talking about earlier. You weep because you know something's wrong and you need God to move. That's good. That's pure passion. But when you just crying hopelessly and give it, you know, totally giving up, and you've got no hope in God, that's just your body saying, I can, we're, we're, we can't do it. And that little passage there just says that Esau gave up his inheritance as a Christian 
by asking for food, believe it or not. Any big food eaters in the house? Anyone into food? Come on, be honest, please, because I don't want to be the only one with my hand up. Thank you. Right, come on. Oh, good. That's good. Sometimes someone comes along with HSP and says, do you want this or do you want to save your 20 bucks towards that, you know, you know your studies and stuff? Oh, I love the HSP, mate. And you have the HSP, the kebab, right? Because you can't put off that thing, can you? You can't resist it. You know, your passion right in that moment is, I just want to be gratified right now by food or sexual intimacy or something else. I want it now. I can't wait till I'm married in a godly marriage. That's the wrong decision. That's the wrong decision. When you wait and you let God bring the right person into your life, it's brilliant, isn't it, guys? Eh? Yes, Kev, you're supposed to say yes. <laughs> it's wonderful, Pastor Jay. It's the best thing I... Come on, Kev. Oh, dear. It's terrible, isn't it? Recently married, just in case you wondered. Godly passion requires a tender heart. In the list of kings, it says that in Josiah, it says of Josiah as one of the kings, in 2 Kings 22 verse 19 it says, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants that they should become a desolation and a curse and have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. The reason God gets us emotional and if we, if we let ourselves get emotional is because he wants to do something. He wants to fix it. But he will not just do stuff without us. You know that. We have to pray. We have to be willing to pray and lead our lives as he wants us to lead them. So godly passion actually results in godly actions or acts. Okay? It doesn't result in depression, hiding in your house, all those kind of, that's fleshly passion. But godly passion makes you do something. Have a look at this. Ezra wept and he rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah wept and he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Mordecai, who knows who Mordecai is? Anyone know? In the book of Esther. Mordecai wept and he was the reason the Jews were saved from Haman. I believe we're going to be saved from Haman, guys. just going to tell you that now. Dan Andrews is just following the same path as Haman. Trying to set a rule in place that will bring down the church. Ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen, relax. But do pray. Job wept again and again as he struggled to see God's purpose in allowing Satan to attack and rob from him. But actually, that story was revealing to the whole of Christian kingdom of God how things work. Right? We learned something dramatic from that situation that at the time seemed completely pointless. Isaiah wept as he was shown the holiness of God. And if you find out that God is awesome and holy, sometimes it's a bit shocking, isn't it? To be like, oh my gosh, I am actually seriously selfish. Oh gosh, Lord, I'm so sorry. And it does move you because you think, why? I don't want to be like that. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet and he wrote Lamentations, a book called Lamentations, a lament. Have you heard of that? When everyone's singing out a sad song. All right, some of you got them on your, on your uh, MP3 players, haven't you? Walking around. <laughs> yeah, this one makes me cry as well. Stop it. Put on some worship. Praise God anyway. Okay, if you've got a tough situation, praise God anyway. It's a spiritual warfare thing. Okay, we trust God anyway. And Jeremiah revealed that God is not stoic. He's full of emotion. Godly passion is sometimes costly. It hurts. Hosea was actually asked to marry an unfaithful woman and he did and he took her back even after she was unfaithful which incidentally is not the general principle if you look at Ezekiel and Micah too was disgusted at the behavior of people in in the Jewish nation and he cried as well so I want to ask you today this genuine question seriously I don't like I like to be confrontational because I think it's good for us what passion do you have, what high level of emotion do you have for Jesus? If any. How much do you love him? Is he your everything or do you just like the sound of those worship lyrics? You know, you can worship like this. Uh, 
Our God is a lion. All emotional looking. See, this is a great song. I like the beat. Oh, yeah, listen to our voices. Good song. Who wrote this one? This one's awesome. You don't mean any of it. You can do that, right? Would you agree? Is that possible? You can sing along heartily. It's called singing heartily. This is a great song. But in your heart, there's no kind of emotion towards God. If you get tears in your eyes when you're worshipping, it's normally a good thing. I don't know, we left the doors too wide open and the wind's blowing sideways. Just getting your eyes to... And I want, I want to ask these questions too. I want you to ask yourself, and we're going to take two minutes to, to think about this while I pray, and we'll just ask God to, to lead us. What am I passionate about for God? Not in terms of your passion towards God, but your passion to do something for God. What do I long to see him do in this area? All right, let's make it local. Yeah? What's, what's crappy about this area that's not good enough? Young people haven't got enough things to do. Right? I go and see all those kids. They're just up at the skate park. I'm up there with my little kids. I'm looking at them thinking, these poor lads. Like, this is all they've got to do. They need something else. More challenging. Like, make them grow up. Like, give them some inspiration. We might get our youth group going, but we need resources. I'll get into that later. I love those kids. They're awesome. They're very talented. They're, fl they're flipping their scooters around and landing on them. They're brilliant. They're really good. I was really impressed with that. I used to be uh, on a mountain. I was a mountain biker, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that, what they were doing. It's brilliant. But maybe they need somewhere. Maybe they need somewhere where they can be okay about talking about God stuff. Not feel like I was too... It's too like if they can come where it's cool and it's okay to sit down and chill out and relax and have a good place to talk about real stuff, that might be what they need, right? So let's think about what we actually care about right now. Last one. How much am I bothered by abortion or sexual immorality or the corruption of our children? Nice timing, kids. That was great. Here they are. What should we do? Just tell them a load of perverse stuff? What should we do? Whisper it in their ears? Of course not. We, don't, we want them to have some, what we call innocence. We want them to grow up and make pure choices that are good for them and their bodies, right? You agree with that, right? So that should move us. I'm going to pray and we're going to finish there. All right? And I want you to think, what is relevant for you personally? What do you need to find some emotion about? Maybe you're not being a very emotional person, but maybe you say, Lord, I break my heart. Help me to get a bit passionate about something. Help me to get involved and do something. All right? It's always a challenge, I know, but we can do stuff, guys. We, can do, we are doing stuff already as a church. And if you've not given your life to Jesus properly, or you feel like you've been on the sidelines, why not just say, okay, Lord, I'll go with you today. I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a chance. And you just convince me over time that you're real. That'll do. Let's do it. Lord Jesus, I just want to praise you, Lord, because you're awesome. And I'm not embarrassed to say, I love you, Lord. I love you. I think you're awesome. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of you in any way. And it says, Lord, we, you don't want us to be ashamed of you. So, Lord, we, wherever we have been, like reticent, holding back from saying something about you, Lord, let us talk with boldness. We've got the truth right in front of us, Lord. We have everything in you for godliness. We have the peace of God that we talked about earlier. We are so blessed, Lord, and we need to get other people blessed as well. So, Lord Jesus, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall in this place and that you would speak to each of us. Lord, I pray in our mind's eyes, we imagine things, Lord, that you would speak to us about what you care about in our rap, Lord, in our families. What situation do you want to resolve? Where do we need to be in forgiveness to save ourselves from hard hearts? Where do we need to be uh, given wisdom to save us repeating a cycle? Where do we need to provide a service or a space for others like you would if you were here right now? Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd really give us the passion of Jesus in our hearts. That we, number one, love you. And number two, do exactly what you need done. We want to work with you, Lord. We don't want to do our things on our own and live our own selfish lives. We want to live for you and have passion for Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. And I'll just say, uh, if you want to repeat this in your mind, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I choose to follow you, Lord. Please forgive me and continue to forgive me as I grow closer to you as my Father in heaven. 
Thank you for saving me. Amen.